Hey y'all, what's up? Welcome back to ENL 51, Rap as Poetry, Summer Session 2, 2021. Uh, this is the video for week one. Um, in this video, hopefully you've already watched my syllabus slash intro video. Uh, but in this video, I'm going to talk about some concepts, some background concepts and definitions that'll help us get into our, our theme for the week, introduction to rap and as poetry, storytelling and shit talking is the theme of the week. Uh, so I'll talk about some concepts and some background ideas, and then I'll, I'll give a, a brief introduction to the songs that we're studying for the week. Cool, introduction to rap and as poetry, storytelling and shit talking. <laughs> Cool. Uh, so first, uh, defining some of our, our terms, I think, is, is an important starting point. So uh, hip hop and rap. Hip hop is the name of the culture. And rap is what an MC, a master of ceremonies, does. Uh, so rapping, the verbal art of putting words together, uh, is one of the four elements of hip hop culture. Traditionally, uh, people say hip hop has four elements. That's rapping, DJing, graffiti writing, and break dancing. Some people say there's a fifth element. There's a, the, the hip hop store in my hometown of Minneapolis is called the fifth element. Um, and then KRS-One, a classic uh, old school rapper who has positioned himself as kind of like a teacher and spiritual leader of the hip hop community. He says there are nine elements of hip hop culture. So it depends who you ask. Nevertheless, uh, rap, rapping is what an MC does. And hip hop is the name of the culture overall. Uh, so we might call it rap music, that is music with rapping in it. We might call it hip hop music, that is music that uh, stems from and participates in hip hop culture. I might use those terms uh, when talking about the music a little bit interchangeably. Uh, but it's important to know the, the background of these different terms. Cool. So hip hop culture uh, was a culture that was created, as I said in my last video, by mostly black and brown folks, mostly working class folks in New York in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, there's a beautiful and really interesting history around that. Uh, Jeff Chang is, a, is one of the best historians of hip hop culture. He has a book called Can't Stop, Won't Stop. That's one of the resources I recommend if you're interested in the, the history in particular. And I just found out he has like connections to Davis and, and I didn't know that. Uh, but I, I need to dig a little bit more into that before I share that history lesson with you all because I'm still learning it. Uh, but anyway, um, so now, of course, rap music is a global phenomenon. It exists in pretty much every culture. It's used not only by black and brown artists who live in working class communities, but also by like fucking McDonald's and stuff like that. Corporations uh, putting rap songs in their commercials. Uh, Febreze, I think I've heard of Febreze rap. It was embarrassed to sound like Pandora uh, the commercial or whatever, uh, I think I, there was this song came on. I was like, yeah, okay, who is this? And it was like Febreze. And I was like, oh my God, what is happening? That's what happens when you turn 35, I guess, as you get down to Febreze commercials. Yep. <laughs> what was I talking about? So um, even though hip hop or rap music at least has become this kind of global phenomenon, sort of bastardized by uh, corporate capitalist culture and all kinds of stuff. Uh, nevertheless, I would like to suggest that rap and hip hop are, are always going to be beholden to their roots. They're always going to owe something to uh, the, the creators of the culture, which is mostly working class, mostly black, black and brown folks in New York. Um, there's a playwright, August Wilson. Uh, I like him a lot. And he said, he has this quote that, that means a lot to me. He said, um, let me see if I can get it right. He said, <clears throat> all art is beholden to the kiln in which the artist was fired. 
I don't really know how kilns work exactly, but I think fired is a good thing in this case. It's not like you lost your job. Uh, all art is beholden to the kiln in which the artist was fired. In other words, where the artist comes from is always going to find its way into the art that they make. And where hip hop artists come from is not only you know the cities that they rep and talk about in their songs, but also the hip hop culture um, and where that comes from. So throughout the class, we're gonna be thinking about um, how these songs that we're studying represent, speak back to, emerge from, owe something to, or give something back to uh, hip hop culture and its originators. Cool, so that's hip hop and rap. Poetry is a much broader term. We've had something like it in pretty much every culture throughout human history, though it's looked very different in different cultures. In English departments, usually when we talk about poetry, we're studying narrative and lyric verse, two different kinds of verse uh, from England and its former colonies over the last five centuries or so. It's kind of the stuff we study. A narrative poem is a poem that tells a story. A lyric poem is one in which the speaker talks about their emotional and subjective experience. These are terms that we, we use a lot in the study of poetry. And I kind of think they map onto rap songs pretty well. Uh, we're gonna be studying songs in this class that tell stories that are narrative in nature. And we're gonna study songs that talk about uh, emotional and subjective experience in not exactly narrative ways. So we might call those lyric. Um, yeah, so I think we, we can study these as emanations of these longer poetic traditions, but we have to also keep in mind that hip hop is always coming from this culture uh, that is especially rooted in black and brown American working class experience. So we're gonna find traditions from songwriting, traditions from African and African American storytelling and poetics and stuff like that, in addition to these, these more general uh, poetic traditions that especially stem from England and former colonies. Cool. Um, I think that's about all I have to say about the, the theme, the, the concepts for this, this week. Uh, storytelling and shit talking are two very common things that we find in rap songs. They're not the only sorts of things that rap songs do. Uh, and there's, there's some overlap. Sometimes the story is a way to talk shit. Uh, sometimes shit talking requires storytelling, etc. cetera. Uh, but I think these are good places to start for stuff that a lot of rap songs do and might lean one way or the other. Uh, both, both the tradition of storytelling in rap, in rap history, and the tradition of, of boasting, of bragging, or as I've called it here for sonic purposes, shit talking. Uh, both of them have really important cultural roots and really important kind of poetic and philosophical and intellectual and cultural motivations. Um, we might hear a song where a rapper is just boasting about how great he is uh, and think like, oh, that's kind of, you know, that's a little bit shallow or vain or it's not particularly interesting. Why are we studying that in a poetry class? Um, but, you know, one of my teachers, I think it was Alex Pate, uh, who is a great scholar of hip hop. He has an awesome book. Uh, maybe it's called In the Heart of the Beat. Man, I really should learn how to Google stuff before I just start talking and recording, uh, but I'm not gonna re-record this again. So here we are. Uh, Alex Pate uh, told me that, you know, one of the core motivations and foundations uh, of why rappers do what they do, of why rap comes out the way it does, is for rappers to be able to say, I am, I exist, I am a human being. And especially in a socio-cultural political landscape where so often black folks are considered as or treated as less than human, 
uh, in so many different ways, hip hop emerges into that culture and creates an incredibly expressive, incredibly creative, incredibly powerful, and incredibly in your face for mostly black and brown folks to, to say, I'm important, my experience is important, here's why I, as a human being, uh, matter, right? Um, and so even songs where, you know, Rakim, I'm going to talk about the required songs in just a minute, even if Rakim is just like boasting about how dope he is, and it doesn't have like anything that you might consider like a deeper meaning or theme, I think there's something profoundly deep about that, about, you know, in the 1980s, in uh, kind of Reagan era, post Reagan era, United States, where poor people, people from urban areas and black people uh, are, are not really considered important contributors to culture and society uh, by mainstream white supremacist ideas uh, of what America is and means and who's important. Uh, in that landscape for Rakim to come out and say, you know, I'm a genius, I'm a, I'm a literary verbal genius and prove it and show it in the creative way that he, that he lays his words over music. I think that's revolutionary. Um, so yeah, I wanted to kind of come back and add that, uh, that it's not just shit talking for the sake of shit talking exactly. I mean, it is, but the, the meaning of that is so much more profound than, than you might expect if you're not really investigating it. So that's one of the, the reasons why we're studying rap songs as poems is to pay close attention to what they're doing and to ask why they're doing it and to look for those personal, intellectual, spiritual, cultural, political, historical motivations and meanings and purposes and intentions and all that frameworks and all kinds of cool stuff. So yeah. Um, so for all of this week's songs, I'm gonna transition now into introducing this week's required songs. And I'll talk a little bit about the B-sides too, uh, and, and the material that we're studying this week in week one for our theme introduction to rap and as poetry, storytelling and shit talking. Um, so as we study this week's songs, uh, I think I want you to reflect on one, is this telling a story or is it bragging and boasting in a non-storytelling way? Or is it some kind of mix of the two? Uh, how does the balance between narrative and lyric not as in like song lyrics, but as in a subjective poetic expression that is not exactly there. How do those things get balanced in the songs? Why has the rapper chosen this way of, of expressing themselves, uh, narrative or lyric, storytelling or shit talking? Uh, and what are some of their motivations in, in the specific stuff that they're saying? And so I'll give like, little examples of that in my, my breakdown, my background of the songs. And just to say, I hope that you have already, if you haven't, maybe you can pause the video now. I, I would love it if you've already read and listened to at least the required songs once before watching this. And then I want you also to do it again once after watching this. That's my general recommendation i think you'll get the most out of it is you, you start with the songs then come to my lecture and then return to the songs i think it's the, the what you'll get the most out of cool so up on the required songs list first up we've got eric b and rakim uh microphone fiend from 1988 eric b is the the producer the dj he makes the music rakim is the rapper the mc he makes the words and uh, we, we think of in hip hop culture, we think of Rakim as the God MC. Uh, one of his nicknames, Rakim Allah. Uh, he, he's the first dude really in the history of hip hop to, to really innovate what we think of as, as like modern rapping now, like the, the rhythmic and rhyme techniques that we associate with rap. Uh, Rakim was the first person to really like 
come up with complex rhythms and flows, multisyllabic rhyme schemes, internal rhymes, extended metaphors, all kinds of literary techniques. So before Rakim, the old school rappers were mostly, not like entirely, but mostly using very predictable sing-songy rhythms, very predictable basic end rhymes, usually single syllable, uh, occasionally multi-syllable rhymes, but not often, not often using a lot of internal rhyme, not often paying attention to stuff like alliteration or the repetition of the first consonant sounds of words, stuff like that. So Rakim, he does so much more stuff and he's really the first dude who showed uh, some of that creative literary potential uh, of rap music. And so pretty much every rapper that we study after him, uh, every rapper that you'll encounter after Rakim owes a lot to what he did. Uh, he, he laid the blueprint, so to speak. So Microphone Fiend um, is a, I would classify it as a boasting, shit talking song, but it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, there's like a, a mix of positive and negative stuff in it. You know, he's clearly like high on himself and his own abilities, but the way that he uses the language of addiction uh, makes it a little bit more complicated. What exactly is he saying about his relationship to rap, his relationship to language, uh, his relationship to his own identity, and stuff like that um, are questions you might ask as you check out Microphone Fiend, and especially if you choose to write about it for the weekly forum post. Cool. Up next, we've got Ice Cube. It was a good day, 1992. Uh, I imagine that many of you are familiar with Ice Cube, if not as a rapper, maybe as an actor, maybe his age as an actor is already over too, but you know, in like the mid to late 2000s, it seems like he was in a bunch of like, uh, like family movies. Like there's this poster that I can't get out of my head of him with like, uh, uh, what is the, a life jacket. He's like in a boat with a life jacket and maybe a fishing hat. He like has a fishing pole or something like that. He looks all goofy. Uh, that's not what Ice Cube was like when I was growing up. Um, in his NWA days and uh, as a solo artist as well, uh, he had a much different image. And it was a good day is like one of his less violent, less in your face songs. It's a classic, uh, classic storytelling song and i think i'll post this as a as one of the potential prompts for the weekly forum posts uh but my question about this song is what makes this a compelling narrative what do we learn about ice cube his life his social and cultural context by the fact that he finds this a compelling narrative it's actually like not much happens in the story, right? He like plays basketball, he plays dice, he hooks up with a woman or maybe two and gets a burger. Uh, like that's, it's not really like a very eventful narrative, you know? Um, it's probably a lot more happens in his <laughs> family movies and his kids movies than happens in this song. And yet it's like just an absolute classic an iconic hip hop song. Why is that? Cool. Up next, we've got the Notorious B.I.G., Unbelievable. Uh, Biggie, one of the dudes who often gets named as a potential greatest of all time goat rapper. Uh, I, I meant to say that about Rakim, too. Um, and Biggie, tragically, uh, was murdered very young. He only put out, I think, I think there was two albums before he died uh, that he made. And then everything after that is like, more questionable about how it got overproduced and stuff like that. Uh, but unbelievable. I think this is from his album, Ready to Die, uh, which turns out to be a really tragic and ironic, maybe not ironic, uh, name for an album for him. Uh, but this is just like, uh, just kind of mind blowing, really impressive uh, boasting lyric rap. Uh, 
where he just talks about how awesome he is in, in very inventive ways. Uh, his use of rhythm, the way that he interrupts the rhythm and creates somehow a smooth flow by like really interrupting the flow of sentences and, and stuff like that is to me super impressive. It speaks back to some of the, the groundwork that Rakim laid, but it also pushes a lot of it to the next level. Uh, Biggie, one of the best rhymers of all time. I like this song a lot, good beat too. Up next, we've got Outcast, Aquemini, 1998. Um, Outcast, one of the greatest hip hop duos, MC duos of all time, Big Boy and Andre 3000. Uh, I think Aquemini. Big Boy, I think, is the first, has the first verse. Uh, he has the slightly deeper voice. Um, and Andre 3000, usually thought of as like, has a little bit stranger personality than Big Boy. Uh, and so they they kind of play very different character parts in a lot of outcast music. And the interplay between them is something that uh, the fans and listeners have found endlessly fascinating. Uh, I love this song. I think it's beautiful. I think it has both lyric and narrative elements. There's boasting, there's storytelling, there's sad stuff, there's amazing stuff. And for my money, uh, the, the last half verse by Andre 3000 is just like, just super cool. Just one of the best, one of my favorite verses. I'm going to say that like a lot this summer, one of my favorite verses, but this is the first time I'll say it. I think it's great. Um, maybe this is a fine enough place to, I, I want to also give some examples of how to develop analysis about these songs, some questions to ask and some things to focus on. So maybe in Aquemini, you know, there's this part where I don't have the lyrics in front of me. I should have prepared for this a little bit better. Uh, there's this part where Andre is like, street scholars majoring in culinary arts, you know, how to work the bread, cheese, and dough from scratch. The only catch is you can get caught, know what you're selling, what you bought. Uh, and so he uses an extended metaphor here of using cooking terminology, the diction of, of food uh, to talk about uh, illicit economic activity on the streets. Uh, whether that be selling drugs or, or something like that. And so he uses these, these kind of double, double entendres, double meaning terms uh, to talk about the kinds of activities that the folks in his community participate in, uh, the ways that they have to survive. And so that's Noticing that is part one of developing analysis. That's still kind of stating a fact about the song. Uh, he's using double entendres. That's a fact. Um, or puns or what, you know, whatever you want to call them. And then to develop analysis, the next step is to kind of ask questions about that. Well, what is he saying about the relationship between these uh, illicit economic activities and the, the metaphorical terms that he's using? Why does he describe it? Uh, describe selling drugs in a, in a way that is in, in the language of something that's much more acceptable, cooking. Why does he call it, you know, being scholars, uh, majoring in culinary arts? What is this language of, of education and learning doing here? Uh, and so you kind of sit with and chew on those questions and try to figure out, well, okay, is he, is he you know, celebrating the survival skills of people in the hood, even if it's activities that we might not approve of or agree with. He's saying like, there's a, an element of, of skill and genius there. Maybe that's part of it. Um, is that supposed to be kind of like sad or heartbreaking to us a little bit? Uh, that this is what the folks in his community have to spend their energy learning and trying to do is like, it's basic survival stuff that's especially dangerous. Uh, yeah. And, and so you kind of just keep chewing on and mulling over these questions and, and your understanding of, of all of the potential meanings and purposes and cultural contexts uh, that, that he's working with. 
your understanding kind of deepens. And that's the goal of analysis. You could write a paragraph about that for a weekly forum post uh, about just that, four lines or whatever, and, and you can do a pretty good job. Cool, okay. Jay-Z, public service announcement 2003. I'm pretty sure most of you know about Jay-Z or at least I've heard of him, if not really listened to him. He's another dude who gets mentioned as a potential greatest of all time rapper quite often. Uh, he had like eight number one albums in eight years, which is outrageous. Uh, to this day, I, I can't understand. Nobody has done that. That's like, he's really prolific. He's really skilled. He makes amazing songs. And public service announcement, uh, really fun boasting that I think is also ripe for that same kind of analysis I was just talking about. Zeroing in on a couple of images and seeing what is he doing here? Uh, why is he comparing these things? Why is he comparing himself to this? Uh, and just kind of letting it simmer and see what comes out of it. Next up, uh, someone significantly less famous. I, this is another thing I try to balance is like the, the iconic, uh, legendary, famous figures in hip hop culture and some, some maybe lesser known artists who I think do just as impressive, if not more impressive stuff with the art form. Dessa, uh, she's from my hometown, Minneapolis. She's part of a crew called Doomtree. I think she had a song on one of the Hamilton soundtracks as maybe one of her claims to fame. I, I haven't seen Hamilton, sorry. Uh, Mineshaft 2. This is, to, to me, I think this is an incredible storytelling song. Uh, Dessa uses the classic three verse structure. A lot of rap songs have three verses of, of 16 bars each uh, or thereabouts. Um, and she uses that classic structure to tell a story with a beginning, a middle and an ending. She sets up the, the dramatic situation. There's like uh, tension rising and then there's this climax So she figures out what she has to do. And there's a little bit of a uh, falling action, denouement. So it has it has classic narrative structure. If you were to take like a intro to fiction class, we'd talk about that plot structure. She uses that classically and maps it onto the, the three verse rap song structure. Uh, just really impressively. She's one of my favorite rappers personally. Uh, I think she shows up on the syllabus multiple times this summer. And then Azalea Banks, 212. Um, Pretty sure is an area code in New York. Another thing I should have Googled before recording this. Um, I, the the rhyme scheme here, I, the the multi-syllable chain rhymes that Azalea Banks uses in this song just blow my mind. I just I find it so impressive, so fun. The way she blends also different tones of voice, not not as much physically like the way Nicki Minaj uses like uh, very different actual physical tones, but I mean uh, like emotional tones or moods. There's like four different Azalea Bankses in this song. And I think it's, uh, I just think it's really fucking cool. I don't know. And I'm excited to see what y'all have to say about it if you want to write about it for the weekly forum post. Cool, so on the B-sides, the optional songs, again, we've got a mix of old school, golden era, more contemporary stuff, um, and a mix of kind of iconic famous folks and a little bit more underground rappers and some stuff in between. MC Light was one of the first really important woman rappers. Um, I Crammed Understand You Sam, great narrative song that has kind of a, I don't know if it's a twist exactly, but a sort of reveal that's kind of fun. But fun is maybe the wrong word. Uh, MC Light, great rapper, great uh, song. DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, also known as Will Smith. Parents just don't understand. Uh, I think Fresh Prince Will Smith is underrated as a rapper. Not a lot of people who are like really into hip hop uh, really talk about Will Smith as a, as a great rapper. Uh, but they won the first rap Grammy, I think for this song, the first Grammy ever given for rap music was given to DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. I think the way that Prince uses humor and narrative uh, an exaggeration and just his personality, the same kind of charisma that makes him a fun actor. Uh, I think it's, I think it's underrated to say the least. I, I like DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince a lot. Wu-Tang Clan, uh, what Wu-Tang did in New York, they kind of ushered in a new era. They were, it was, this was before there was such a thing exactly as underground hip hop. 
Uh, there wasn't exactly a split between what was going on commercially and what was going on beneath the surface. But uh, the styles that Wu-Tang developed, the innovative and bizarre use of language uh, that they that they utilized uh, would have a lot of influence on the underground scene over the next uh, 15 years or so after them. Uh, and so, yeah, the way they invent their own slang, I think is super cool. They have kind of their own mythology uh, and several of their members I see on like top 10, top 20 rappers of all time lists often. Nas, Memory Lane, 1994 from Illmatic. Nas uh, had a pretty legendary beef or uh, dispute. dispute, why would I call it that? Uh, he had a pretty legendary conflict with Jay-Z. Um, and I personally have always sided with Jay-Z on that. And so it's kind of hard for me to remember that actually Nas is pretty good, but uh, he, he's quite a poet. He's quite a rapper, uh, especially Illmatic, his, his greatest album. Um, so I needed to get him on the syllabus. Common, a uh, rapper from Chicago. I love him a lot. He started out as an underground rapper. We will study another one of his songs later in the, the semester, uh, but this one, The Corner, I think, just kind of describes the, the the, the literal uh, area in the city that is home to so much of hip hop culture. And then finally, Shad. Yeah, I get it. Shad is a Canadian rapper. Uh, the, the level of his double entendres, of his puns and punchlines, uh, the double meaning in pretty much every line in this song, I think is super cool, fun, impressive. Uh, yeah, and then I try to put videos on the list a lot too. We've got a video for Childish Gambino. This is America. I imagine many of y'all came across this and went like very viral. Uh, just so you know, it, it speaks about, or visually represents gun violence in a pretty startling way. It's intentionally startling. So just be prepared for that if you if you haven't seen it before. Cool. Um, we're gonna read some of Adam Bradley's The Book of Rhymes, uh, which I talked about in the last video. If you have trouble accessing that, let me know. And we've got some poems uh, that I wanna just, the page poems are like more recommendations than anything else. I'm not, I'm not gonna test you on them. They're not gonna be on the exams. Uh, I think there'll be a place for you to optionally write about them on the exams if you want, but uh, instead of, songs. But anyway, I, I think a, a lot of what what we're studying in this class kind of bridges the gap between rap songs and, and poems on the page. So I wanted to share with you every week some poets who participate in, engage in hip hop culture in meaningful and cool ways. So first up, we've got John Murillo. Uh, this is from his first book, Up Jump the Boogie, which is all about kind of hip hop culture and stuff. It's out of print now. Uh, he just had a, a second book come out in the last year or so called, I think it's called Contemporary American Poetry, but Contemporary is with a K. Uh, I haven't read that one yet, but I, a lot of my friends are really digging it. This poem, Ode to the Crossfader, is really cool uh, in the way that, so very short rap history lesson, hip hop, sonically, one of the big innovations that led to the creation of hip hop culture and, and rap music is that DJs figured out uh, that they could find what they call a break on a, on a record, like a, a portion that's just music, there's no vocals or anything. And that especially is like drum and bass driven. Uh, and they realized if they just kept playing that break over and over, they could create like a smooth fluid music for people to dance to at parties and stuff. And then rappers came in and started rhyming over it. Uh, and so there'd be these legendary like block parties in the late seventies in New York uh, where, where DJs would perfect this. And so then uh, I actually don't know if this piece of technology comes from hip hop culture or if it preceded uh, rap, but uh, the crossfader is a, is a piece of technology that allows a DJ to switch from one record to another and kind of fluidly and smoothly. So uh, the DJ will be playing the break on one record 
and then listening and finding the break on another on the on a copy of the same exact record and so then they just like when the break was over on one they switch over to the to the other record and then find go back and find the break on the first record again so they're playing the same portion of two copies of the same record over and over again it's a long explanation but uh john murillo in this poem ode to the crossfader thinks about that process of switching between records of repeating a loop looping music and, and thinks about that as kind of a metaphor for history and our relationship to time and identity and stuff in some cool ways so the repetition he uses the ways that he kind of rewinds a little bit i think are pretty cool Chinaka Hodge, small poems for big. I think these are haiku. I should, I haven't read this poem in, in six months, uh, but I know that I want to share it with you. I think it's all haiku, uh, but they're all short poems about or for the notorious B.I.G. Um, and then Hanif Abdul Rakib, one of my favorite poets. Uh, this poem, Ode to Drake, ending with blood in a field. Hanif writes a lot about. Uh, hip hop and hip hop culture. He also writes about pop culture and music more generally. He's a he's a music writer and music critic, in addition to being a poet and essayist. He has a book about a tribe called Quest. He has a book of essays that got really popular a couple years ago. He's got a couple books of poems. Great writer, great person. Uh, yeah, I think that's about all I have to say for this week. As always, if you have any questions uh, about what I've said in this lecture about any of the material, about the expectations, anything like that, feel free to shoot me an email and I can answer your questions over email or we can set up a time to chat on Zoom. Uh, cool, thanks y'all. I'm looking forward to seeing what you have to say about these songs in the weekly forum posts. Uh, so that'll be available to you uh, soon.